Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Prashant Bondada. I am a database engineer with the RDS team focusing on SQL Server. I have with me Henry Sinclair, who is a database manager working for Allstate. I will be walking us through some of the best practices that we recommend customers adopt while running SQL Server in RDS. And Henry will talk, us, uh, will talk to us about uh, Allstate, um, you know, their database plans, uh, how they're leveraging RDS, and some of the problems that they're trying to solve, um, some lessons they've learned, and some of the tests that they've done so far. Um, I'm not feeling too well. Uh, I have some internal pain, so you know, in case I need to step off, we also have uh, Richard Wehmeyer, who is our principal database specialist. Um, hopefully, it doesn't come to that. Um, <laughs> but we're ready. <laughs> we're multi-AZ today. <laughs> exactly. Um, so the idea is to you know, look at some of the best practices for availability, um, security, and data migration. Uh, we also wanted to do performance, but there wasn't enough time. But you know, I will make some call-outs to uh, performance-related aspects you know, in uh, conjunction with these areas. There were a few rated breakouts to SQL Server you know, before. Um, I think those were probably not level 300, so this will be slightly more technical. And there's one coming up uh, later today, and that's uh, my manager is the one doing that. That's going to focus on SQL Server on AWS. So it's going to compare RDS and EC2. Um, and since I mentioned it now, I can tell him that I have done my part in marketing his talk. So really quickly, you know, RDS is a managed database service. Um, it makes it easy to provision and run uh, relational databases in the cloud. And uh, we, we support you know, six relational engines, starting with Aurora, which has the Postgres and MySQL variants. We have open source engines, Postgres, MariaDB, and MySQL, and the commercial engines, SQL Server, and Oracle. Um, one thing is this deck is going to be available for download after the talk is done, maybe in a day or so, uh, on SlideShare. And you know, the whole presentation is going to be recorded on YouTube. So if you find any of this information useful, you will have access to it at a later point of time. So, as a managed service, RDS takes care of you know, a bunch of things that normally you would be doing yourselves on premises. So starting from provisioning, right? from, from data center locations to power supplies to racks and servers and hypervisors and guest operating systems and database software, it's all provisioned for you. And with any software, you also have patching that comes along. Um, and so we take care of that. You know, database activities like uh, database backups, log backups, restores are very easy to do in RDS. They're either uh, automated or just a few clicks. And you know, similarly, we take care of making sure the databases are highly available, and we also monitor the databases and take appropriate recovery actions. Even though all that is done, you know, there are a bunch of options that you can configure. And you know, basing on what you configure, um, we set up and provision the database and maintain the database. You know, so all of those are inputs for us. For instance, we support like, multiple instance types. Um, so you know, if you are just a more generic workload, we have the M series. If it's uh, a workload that needs more memory, we have the R series. Again, in each type, we have different classes, starting from like the large to the extra large, you know, going up all the way to like 16 extra large. Um, and you know, when you scale that way, you get more vCPUs, you get more memory, you get more network and you know, storage throughput. We support SQL Server from 2008 to 2017. Uh, we support enterprise, standard, web, and express editions. For storage, you, know, you can choose whether you want GP2 volumes or IO1 volumes. If you need uh, you know, consistent performance, then IO1 is what we'd recommend. You, know, you can choose which clients actually have network accessibility to your database, you know, what port you want to run your, your database on. Some applications might need the database to be running in a different time zone. Um, you know, do you want backups enabled? How long do you want to retain those backups? Uh, you know, do you have any PII data, or do you want to encrypt your data? You know, um, is this a production workload? Do you want to enable high availability for this instance? And also different levels of monitoring. So as you can see, there are a ton of things that you know you can actually configure. So the idea is to talk about some of these configurations and you know just um, some of the best practices that we recommend for availability, migration, and security. 
So let's get started with availability. Um, so AWS has you know presence in multiple geographical locations. Like we we have a presence in uh, North Virginia and we call that US East One, and we also have presence in Oregon and we call that US West Two. So each of these geographical locations where we have presence, we call them regions, and each region has multiple availability zones. Right? So like the US East One region has five availability zones, the US West Two region has three availability zones. So depending on the demand and the usage, we have more availability zones. And availability zones, um, and I'm just going to refer to them as AZs going forward. So AZs have been architected such that a failure um, in one availability zone doesn't you know, impact another AZ. Also, they have been built with you know, sufficient excess bandwidth. So in case you have one AZ go offline, the other AZ can take in traffic that the uh, AZ that's offline is not able to serve. In RDS, when we say a database is highly available, um, we essentially mean that the database can sustain an outage to an entire availability zone. Okay. Um, this is how a typical single AZ deployment looks like. So you know, we use EC2 for the virtual machine, and that's the database instance, and we use EBS for the storage. So your SQL Server binaries are all on the EC2 boot volume C drive, and the EBS volume has all the data files. As you can see, EBS does replicate data you know, between the primary volume and the secondary volume, and that is completely transparent to us. Um, if something would happen to the volume, they would fail over, and even we wouldn't uh, realize that that's been happening on the back end. In terms of recovery for a single AZ deployment, uh, it can be from you know, a couple of minutes to many hours. If SQL Server crashes, we typically detect that in less than 10 seconds and we'll restart SQL Server. After we restart SQL Server, depending on you know, crash recovery, it will just take some time to come back online. Um, if the whole EC2 instance goes offline, at that point, we again, you know, we'll detect that, we'll provision a new EC2 instance, and we'll attach the same volume to the EC2 instance, so there's no data loss at all. Uh, however, this process takes slightly longer. It's going to take like maybe 10 to 15 minutes. Um, if the entire availability zone goes offline, there isn't much that we can do till the AZ comes online. However, you know, there are use cases where you're not running your production in this deployment model, so you might be okay with you know, a data loss of like five to 10 minutes. And if that is the case, you know, like for your dev or you know, your UAT systems, then you can always uh, request uh, for a point in time restore of this instance into a different availability zone. That way at least you have unblocked your dev teams um, and you know, when this AZ comes back online, we'll bring the instance back online for you. And we, we totally understand that this is not something that is acceptable for a production workload. And that's why we have the multi-AZ uh, deployment model. So the multi-AZ deployment model within a single AZ, it's very, very similar to the previous one. We still have an EC2 instance, we still have the EBS volume that gets replicated. However, we also have, you know, physical replication between the two availability zones. Now, depending on the version and edition of SQL Server that you're running, that is going to change. So for 2016 Enterprise Edition, and very soon for 2017 Enterprise Edition, the physical replication is going to be done via always on. Uh, for any other version and, and edition, it's going to be database mirroring. So with multi-AZ deployments, um, we set up synchronous replication and we set up SQL Server for automatic failover. The downtime we have seen you know, typically is around a minute for SQL Server to detect that you know, the primary is unavailable and the you know, quorum will basically fail over. Um, so it's definitely a lot more resilient than you know, the single AZ deployments and uh, this is what we recommend for uh, production. Uh, one more thing I'd like to call out here is you know, with database mirroring, you, know, you might end up in a situation where you know, some databases are online on the primary node, some of them are online on the secondary node. Um, you know, when that happens, so essentially it's split replication. So we detect that and we either you know, um, fail the remaining databases or we fail the ones that failed over back such that you always have all databases online on one side. So this is how a failover you know, is going to work in RDS. So as you can see, 
um, you know, we publish the RDS endpoint, and that is what you connect to. So you connect to the RDS endpoint, that is pointing to the primary um, server's IP address, and then something happens. You know, and either SQL Server crashed or the entire instance crashed. Uh, when that happens, SQL Server you know, is going to do the failover. And uh, the first thing that's going to happen is replication is going to break between primary and secondary, quickly followed by SQL Server failing over. And as you can see, the secondary has become the primary. At that point, we detect that this has happened. We you know, change the RDS endpoint to point to the new primary. And then we go back and see what went wrong with the old primary. Was it just SQL Server crashing? If that's the case, we'll just restart SQL Server. If it was the instance going away, then you know, we'll replace it. If the AZ is offline, we'll keep monitoring it till AZ comes back online. And eventually, we will fix the secondary and we'll re-enable replication. So it's because of the way we do this you know, that the typical downtime with a multi-AZ outage is approximately a minute. Now, um, let's look at some of the best practices you know, for availability, some things that you, know, you can do. For single-AZ deployments and multi-AZ deployments, you know, when SQL Server crashes, it has to go through crash recovery. So you know, look at your workload and check and see um, what you want your crash recovery times to be. And you can you know, set the recovery interval at the server level. Uh, in RDS, you don't have access to do SP configure. Um, but you can always set this in a custom parameter group and apply that parameter group to your instance. You can also do this at the database level using the alter database set target recovery. And remember, um, you know, SQL Server has changed the default checkpoint behavior. So in 2012 SQL Server, Microsoft introduced indirect checkpoints. Right? Um, however, that was not um, the default until 2016. So in 2012, um, if you do not have the target recovery time set, SQL Server is going to use the recovery interval to decide how frequently it needs to do checkpoints. In 2016, by default, the target recovery time gets set to 60 seconds for all databases. So you know, if you want to use indirect checkpoints in 2012, make sure you go set it at the, at the database level. If you want to use recovery interval um, in 2016, make sure you set the target recovery time to zero at the database level. So you know, just look at your workload and see how you know, being more aggressive with checkpoints is impacting your performance uh, because you know, when you want to reduce the crash recovery times, you will be doing more aggressive checkpointing. Now, as I was saying before, for production workloads, we definitely recommend enabling multi-AZ. You know, it's a lot lesser downtime for you. Even for non-prod systems, if you want to perform any kind of a scale operation, whether it's a scale up or a scale down or you want to upgrade, we recommend enabling multi-AZ before you do the scale. What that does is it reduces the downtime for the entire scale operation. Um, in RDS, when we scale, we always scale the secondary first. We re-enable synchronization between the primary and secondary. And then we scale the old primary. And then we bring them back in sync. Right? So that way, for a non-prod system also, if you want to reduce downtime, so, you know, we recommend enabling multi-AZ. One thing I'll call out here with regarding to performance is you know, if you're going to enable multi-AZ just to make sure that your scale operations don't take much of a downtime, enable multi-AZ two, three days before. And the reason why I say this is when you do a snapshot in RDS, essentially it's an EBS snapshot. The, the snapshot gets taken and all the blocks are actually on S3. They're not actually on the volume. So we create a new volume off of that snapshot and the volume is available to use immediately. It has pointers to all the blocks in S3. So if you start using the volume right away, you will see some performance impact because the blocks need to get pulled from S3. If you do this two, three days before, EBS you know, has this passive hydration that they keep doing. And there's a very good chance that when you, you do the failover, you know, your volume is already warm and you won't see much of a performance impact. Now, you know, configuring TempDB, um, you know, on premises, we are used to like you know seeing two instances, so we, we kind of remember to go and configure TempDB on primary and secondary. With RDS, we expose just one endpoint, so I've seen some customers forget to do this, but you know, this is a, a good practice for an you know, RDS EC2 on prem anywhere. Make sure you configure TempDB to be the same on both primary and secondary. Um, also, 
we have some server level objects like so the frequently changed server level objects like logins those are all replicated for you and so you make a change to a login you know we detect that we record it and we make the same change on the secondary um, but for infrequently changed objects like linked servers or server roles or agent jobs we don't replicate those so what we recommend is you know make all of those changes make all of those configurations um, on a single AZ deployment first and then do it on a multi AZ and sorry and then convert it to a multi AZ as i was saying we do a snapshot and restore so all the objects are there in the snapshot and they come up on a secondary also um, if you have a multi AZ system on which you're making a change to agent job then our recommendation is to convert that to single AZ first and then enable multi AZ again such that all the changes go across. Um, this is the recommended way of doing it. If you do not want to do that, the other option is to create your agent jobs in the primary, call the RDS API with the reboot switch, and that will cause a failover to happen. Um, and when the failover happens, then you can go and recreate your agent jobs or whatever changes you have made on the new primary. Another very important aspect with you know, availability is make sure you test your performance before enabling multi AZ. Sorry, uh, yes. Uh, what happens is you know, when you have multi AZ enabled, we are doing a synchronous write across the network to a different availability zone. So that means your write transactions are going to see increased latency. Right? Now, this is uh, a write intensive workload to kind of show you how much of an impact you might see. If you have an OLTP workload with you know, 90% read, 10% write, then this will not be what you will see. You will see all these three lines much closer. Um, so here what I'm showing is, you know, your best performance comes with single AZ. Um, after that, you have always on, and the last is mirroring. So as you can see, all the improvements that Microsoft made with always on, you know, you do see significant performance gains. Um, so in, in any case, make sure, you know, you test your application performance when multi AZ is enabled. Um, you know, we've seen customers, you know, load the instance, migrate data in, do some testing on single AZ, and just before go live, they convert to multi AZ, and then they realize that, oh, they hadn't provisioned sufficient IOPS, or the instance class was not set properly, just because multi AZ has the performance you know, impact. Now, for, to take advantage of, you know, the quick failovers, um, make sure that your applications have the ability of retrying. So whenever SQL Server crashes, all connections are going to get terminated. Right? So the application needs to be able to retry connecting such that when we do failover, you can now connect to the new primary. Another very important thing is to make sure that you are not caching the RDS endpoint IP address too long. So you know, as long as your DNS time to live is around 30 seconds, it should be okay. You know, we've seen cases where customers had that set to like five minutes or 10 minutes. So what happens is the primary crashes, you know, it fails over, we detect it, we change the IP address for the RDS endpoint, but the client hasn't seen the new IP address because it's cached it for them for like five to 10 minutes. And so it keeps retrying, but it's just going to go to the, the old primary, which is not usable. And, you know, so they think that they've, they've have a long downtime. So make sure, you know, your, your client side DNS is set to a low value. Um, you know, with always on, we're also exposing the listener endpoint. So, um, and the way that works is if you do an NS lookup on the listener endpoint, it will give you back two IP addresses. And, you know, if you're using the multi-subnet failover is equal to true in your connection string or in your client settings, um, it will try to talk to both IP addresses. The primary is the one that's going to come back first. It'll just connect to that. Um, and we've seen some really good, you know, uh, failover times when using always on with the listener and with the multi subnet failover. Um, and these are how some of these times look like, you know. So for mirroring, as you can see, when you do a manual failover, you can expect like a minute, a minute, 10 seconds downtime. With always on, it is like 10 times faster. Um, there are some advantages of using always on with the normal endpoint also. And that's primarily to do with the fact that, you know, when SQL Server crashes, the Windows cluster knows about it and so it doesn't have to wait for uh, a detection phase, it can just ask the primary to come online immediately, and that's why you see those really good failover times. Uh, the worst case is going to be, you know, when primary completely becomes unresponsive. So at that point, we have to wait for a certain amount of time before, you know, doing a failover. Um, if not, we'll see a lot of false positives. And that, with always on, comes during 30 to 35 seconds. Now remember, this just doesn't include the crash recovery times. 
So you know, just factor that in when planning your outages. So with that, you know, uh, those, that was availability. Now let's move on to security. So you know, three things we think about with regard to security are you know, restrict access as far as possible, audit access, and encrypt data. Right? When it comes to restricting access, you can do it at multiple levels. So the first is the RDS APIs itself. Right? So you can always have um, an IAM user, and you can give him access only to create an instance, stop an instance, start an instance, but maybe not to delete an instance. Right? So that way, you have that level of protection for the RDS APIs using IAM roles and policies. You can always control that. Um, now, inside the VPC itself, you have uh, network ACLs and you have security groups. So security groups are at an instance level. So as you can see, like my, my first two instances there, you know, I've configured them to use one security group. So that's going to define which other instances in my VPC can actually talk to my database instance. Um, the network ACL works at a subnet level. And as you can see, you know, so network ACL is uh, preventing connections or is basically giving me rules as to which instances in my VPC can talk to uh, my instances in my subnet too. So depending on your use case, you can either you know, uh, use a security group or a network ACL to restrict access. Uh, we definitely do not recommend you know, enabling public accessibility for your database. Even if it's a public facing website, right? um, you probably want your web app servers to you know, take the public traffic, but your database should still only be communicating with the web app servers. So you know, do, you know, um, do not enable public access and try avoiding to use the 1433 port. You know, most applications let you configure that. You know, it's very easy for us to change. You can do it during instance create. You can do it after the fact also. Um, you know, we actually seen this happen quite a bit. Um, if you know there are some kind of uh, brute force attacks happening, we usually are looking for like the SA login on port 1433. Right? So avoiding that, you can you know better protect yourself. And again, inside the database itself, you know, all the best practices that you are following on premises in terms of like password rotation or uh, password strength, apply those to RDS also. Um, that's, that's definitely recommended. Now, since we have done our best to restrict access, let's look at like auditing. So one thing that you could easily do in RDS is if you use uh, the SQL Server Inspector audit parameter, that actually uh, enables uh, SQL Server auditing on the instance. So it creates a server level audit, it creates a server level audit specification, and it also adds a bunch of these action groups. Um, the cool thing with this is, you know, by, by enabling the parameter and setting the value to FedRAMP underscore HIPAA, it actually makes your instance FedRAMP and HIPAA compliant also. Now, we did realize that uh, not all customers want all of those action groups and some customers might want even more. So we are going to support SQL Server Audit really soon in RDS. Um, it's going to be a new option. Um, so, you know, there are other options in RDS today, like you know, a TDE is one option, and I'll talk about that in a bit. But this is going to be a new option, and you know, the option settings that we're going to offer are you know, the ability for you to decide if you want to compress your audit files or not. You know, we have seen really good compression, especially with something like audit, where it's like the same things happening over and over again, up to 80%. So we definitely want to compress the files, and the other setting is going to be the S3 bucket name. So the idea is, you know, when you create this option, you will tell us which S3 bucket you want your audit files to get uploaded to, um, and then we'll compress them and we'll upload them. And once they're in S3, you can detain them for however long you want. If you want, you can have a lifecycle set to push them to Glacier, whatever you need after that fact. Uh, the other thing that we're going to offer with audit is, you know, so SQL Server audit files are binary files, right? So you, to read them, you need to access them via SQL Server. So we are going to give you the option of retaining some of these files on the disk for some number of days before we delete them. Typically, if there's a security breach, you know about it in, in a day or two. So you don't have to worry about going and downloading files on S3 and reading them. You can just go to your instance and read the audit files directly there. Uh, the other thing is we are not going to be supporting SQL Server Audit for 2008. You know, there are some nuances with the way SQL Server Audit works on that version that makes it hard for us to offer it. 
Um, and also, if you can um, see, standard web and Express edition do not offer database level auditing uh, for 2012 and 2014. So in, in these use cases, you know, we still do support SQL Server Trace. Um, so here I'm just showing you an easy way to set up um, a SQL Server server side trace that is going to you know, log successful logins. If you just change you know, the 14 to 20, that is going to do the failed logins. And you know, just writing out all this information to the login trace file. Um, and here, this is how you can read the file. You know? um, and if you want to record it into a table, you just create an audit DB database, create a table that matches the audit file columns, and then you can insert data into that going forward. But again, you know, 2008 is, you know, it's almost going to go out of support, so we definitely want you to use the newer versions of SQL Server and use audit instead of trace, because this also is going to be deprecated soon. Now, since you know, we have taken care of restricting access and auditing, um, we can also do things to make sure that if somebody has gotten another access to our database, at least they can't make sense of the data there by encrypting it. Right? So we support both storage encryption at rest and in transit. So for encryption at rest, we support storage encryption using AWS key management service, or if you're running enterprise edition, you could use transparent data encryption, both options are supported. Uh, both of these are completely transparent to your application, so there are no changes needed at all. Uh, from our testing, there wasn't a significant performance impact when enabling this encryption. Um, and in fact, you know, KMS encryption is available for all editions. So you know, if you're using enterprise edition only to get uh, you know, TDE, you don't need to worry about that now. You, know, it's, it's, uh, you can just uh, choose storage encryption, and you know, even for EX edition, your data is going to be encrypted. Uh, one thing that, that TD does, it also encrypts your database backups and log backups. And so we've implemented that for storage encryption also. Okay? So when we do a transaction log backup, we do encrypt it before we upload it to S3. And the same thing for database backups. You know, it's a snapshot which is also encrypted. So in terms of um, you know, your gain, there isn't much that you're going to gain by using TDE. Um, so you can just use storage encryption, which just works on all editions. The other thing that we support is encryption in transit. And so you can do this multiple ways. You know? So we actually publicly give you the certificate that you can download, and you can set in your connection string, encrypt is equal to true, um, either trust the server certificate, or you can actually import the server certificate into a trust store or a key store and use that in your connection string. Or you can just you know, set this parameter in the custom parameter group. You know, when, this, when you do this, we go and we make a change to a registry setting and that forces all uh, network traffic to be encrypted. So a uh, really quick uh, example. This is the TDS stream. You know, um, I was just like sniffing some packets, and this is how it looks like when I don't have encryption enabled. So as you can see, you know, I'm trying to get uh, the first name, last name, salary, and SSN for an employee you know, with employee ID 100. And I can clearly see in the TDS stream that somebody called uh, John, whose SSN is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, is earning a million dollars. I wish I was John. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think that was a, a typo. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so he's earning a million dollars. And if I enable this, this parameter, right, so this is how it's going to look like. It's, it's just gibberish. So it's, it's very, very straightforward to you know, do this, just change the parameter apply that custom parameter group your instance, and you, know, you have encryption in transit also. So that takes us to the end of security. Um, so for the last section I'll be doing today, data migration. So we have actually, we have more ways of migrating data into RDS than what's listed here. Um, and I'll only be doing the best practices for the first two. So the first one is you know, just native backup restore. This is really straightforward. You back up your database to a file. You upload the file to S3. You log into the RDS SQL Server instance. You call our store procedure um, and just pass us the S3 bucket name and the file name, and we'll restore it for you. Okay? Um, the AWS database migration service, that is something that you can do homogeneous or heterogeneous migrations. And we typically do not recommend you know, that for migrations from SQL Server to SQL Server. 
but you know it does have the ability of doing ongoing replication and you know you can basically keep keep doing my, uh, your uh, migration till the time you want to fail over so it does have some advantages um, so if, if you want to use that that's also supported um, or you can just use the traditional export import wizard that works bulk copy um, and there are some uh, AMIs available in the marketplace that you could use um, that you know leverages change tracking in SQL Server to also migrate. Um, so just for uh, the native backups itself, you know, so one thing that we recommend is if you're running Enterprise or Standard Edition, enable compression. Um, you know, the compression protocol has gotten better. The algorithms have gotten better. They do not consume as much CPU as you know in the older versions, um, but it, the compression ratios are really good. You know, this is one of our big financial customers. They had a nine terabyte database that they were able to compress to a three terabyte backup. So what this does is it makes it easy for you to upload that backup file to S3 because instead of transmitting nine terabytes, you're just doing three terabytes. And even when you're doing the restore, we have to just now download three terabytes and restore instead of doing a nine terabyte restore. So it has a significant uh, win in terms of restore times. Um, so we definitely recommend doing that. You know, even if you're just backing it up to S3 for you know safekeeping, you know you save a lot of S3 storage space. So um, compression, you know, definitely a big win. And sorry, um, that was the command, you know, that you would use to set um, compression for all your backups. Now another important thing is you know shrink your transaction log file before you do a backup that you want to use for a restore. So what happens in RDS, we do support instant file initialization, right? Um, however, that doesn't apply to transaction logs. So you know, if you just go to an RDS instance and say create database MDF one terabyte, it'll come back really quickly because SQL Server is essentially just thinly provisioning the storage. But if you say MDF one terabyte, LDF you know, one terabyte, that's gonna take a very long time because SQL Server has to go and zero out the entire transaction log. This is, an this is an interesting case. You know, a customer was saying they have a 500 GB database and it was taking them very, very long to restore. And when we looked into it, we, what we found was the actual restore was finishing in like uh, 45 minutes or something. But then for the next hour and a half, it was just writing zero to the transaction log. So, you know, if you can shrink your transaction log prior to doing the backup and then you restore it, after the restore is done, you can always go back and increase it. Right? And there's no way to change this during the restore process. So that's something that you'll have to do prior. Um, again, with backups, we do support KMS encryption. So even if you're not running on a storage encrypted instance, even if you're not running TDE, but you wanted your database backups to be encrypted, you know, just pass this additional parameter to the store procedure and it will get encrypted. The other thing I like to call out is, you know, do not schedule the native backups to S3 during the same maintenance window as your daily RDS snapshot. So the RDS snapshot is different, right? It basically runs the backup command, but only for a few seconds on your database. The backup to S3 that we do, that is actually going to take much longer time because it needs to you know, read the entire files and spit out another backup file itself. And what happens is when the native backup to S3 is running, we cannot do another backup. SQL Server doesn't need to backup a database at the same time to two different places. So what we end up doing is we actually go and we kill the native backup so we can do the daily backup. And doing the daily backup is really important so that you know, we can guarantee durability. So, and it's a half an hour window. So if you can schedule your native backups after the window, then you won't even know that there's a problem happening and your, and your backups are being killed. Um, Another use case I've seen customers do is they want to back up their database in region A to an S3 bucket in region A, and then they want to copy that backup file to a bucket in region B, right? So what happens is it is faster for you to actually enable S3 bucket replication and then do a backup into the region A bucket and let S3 handle replicating that to a different region instead of you know, first doing the backup and then doing a, uh, an S3 copy. So like, you know, a stat we have here is, um, it took us like four hours to copy a 200 GB backup file from region A to region B, but if I had enabled um, bucket replication in S3 and then into the backup, an hour and a half after the file was available in region A, it was available in region B also. 
So if this is a use case you have, we definitely recommend you know, enabling replication instead of doing a copy after the fact. We also support differential backups when you're doing native backups to S3. And you know, in SQL Server, differential backups are always, um, they need to be applied on the last full backup, right? So this is the query that you can run to make sure that the, the last full backup was actually the backup that you have in S3. There are some things that you, know, you can do which might cause us to kick off a backup. And so imagine a case where you've taken a backup at 12 o'clock and then we do a backup at one o'clock and then two o'clock you come to do a, do a differential backup. The backup will work, but you can't apply it on the backup that you have taken at 12 o'clock because that was not the last full backup. Right? So that is why I just use this query to make sure that the last backup was actually your backup. And uh, yeah, the, I think this is the last one. For um, restores into RDS, if you're restoring onto an instance that is using the multi-AZ deployment model, make sure that before you do the backup on-premises, your recovery model is set to full. So what we do is you know, we take the file in S3, we restore onto the primary and secondary at the same time. On the primary, we do restore with recovery. On the secondary, we do restore with no recovery. So that way, once the restores are done, we can just sync these two backup easily. If your database recovery model was simple before you did the backup, there is no way that we can change it on the secondary. Right? I can change it only after I bring it online. And if I bring it online, then my log chain has forked and you know, I can no longer pair these two up. So that it's just going to make the restore fail. So you know, to avoid all of that, just make sure you set your recovery model to full before you do, do the backup on-premises. So now moving on to database migration service. So in RDS, if you're using DMS, this is going to need you to enable CDC on the database. Um, you know, this is how you would run a DMS task. So to enable CDC, you need this admin privileges, which we don't give in RDS today. However, we do have a wrapped short procedures that you can call that will enable CDC. Um, and you know, it's pretty cool that Microsoft made CDC an SE feature also in 2016 SP1. So if you're on that version, you can always use uh, CDC. And the way CDC, uh, the way DMS works is it basically reads the transaction log file, it extracts the DML and applies that onto your target. Right? So to, a typical task is you enable CDC at the database level and then you enable CDC at the table level and then there are some job parameters that I'll talk to you in a bit. Um, you configure those and then you kick off your DMS task. Right? Now, um, before we get into the parameters, DMS lets you do a full database backup, restore that, and then tell DMS to start applying changes from a particular LSN. So that's um, really neat. So you don't have to use the DMS you know, initial load because that is essentially just reading tables, creating cursors on your target and like bulk uh, inserting it. So the native backup is going to be a much better you know, seeding mechanism than the DMS initial load. Um, after that, so now this is where it gets important, right? The CDC job parameters are really important. So when you enable CDC at the database level and then at the table level, it creates two jobs. It creates one job to capture changes and creates one job to clean up. So, and since DMS is going to use the transaction log, it's important that those changes are in the transaction log till the DMS task has come and read it. So the way you can control that is one thing is you can just stop the job. You can just stop the capture job. So SQL Server is not going to reuse the transaction log and DMS can come and read the changes. The other way is to configure job parameters, like you know, the polling interval. So the polling interval will, if you set that to like an R, right? So SQL Server is only going to go in once an R and it's going to read all the changes to the, tra to the, to the transaction log. It's going to you know, put them in a different table. So that way, uh, you don't have to worry about uh, your, your DMS job not getting data from the transaction log. Um, and since we are actually not letting SQL Server use the transaction log for a long time, you might run into like disk space issues, so do keep monitoring that. And you know, this really important bug that Microsoft fixed with uh, 2016 SP2 CU3, 
Um, so if you are using DMS, we recommend upgrading to that version at least. Um, that way, you know, at least with that version, we haven't seen any more bugs and it works seamlessly. So that um, concludes my part of the presentation. Uh, I am going to um, hand over to Henry Sinclair, who is going to talk to us about our state. Thank you. So thanks very much, Prasant. Uh, so just to let you know, my name is Henry Sinclair. I'm the database manager in Allstate for SQL Server. Uh, and I look after both our on-premise and our cloud strategy uh, moving forward. What I'm going to talk about today is just give a brief background of what we currently have within our environment and what it actually looks like. The testing that we carried out with our partners Fortify Data as well as some of the lessons that we actually learned as part of the testing that we went through over a number of months. So just a brief background in relation to our environment at the minute. So we have a very, very heavily consolidated environment. And what we're really trying to achieve is moving away from that, from our physical and virtual infrastructure that we have on-prem, and starting to push that out into a cloud offering. The design of the environments that we have are 95% shared and only 5% dedicated. So what we tend to have is an awful lot of databases hosted on the shared instances. Within the environment itself, we have hundreds of database servers and thousands upon thousands of databases themselves with a lot of high growth transactions. And that presents an awful lot of challenges for what we currently have. To be able to manage effectively all these databases, we've needed to create an awful lot of customization for things like backups. But it also then leads into how can we actually effectively troubleshoot an issue whenever it occurs. We also struggle then around the chargeback and showback model to actually show the business how much is this actually costing you. So within a shared environment, there's very, very different workload patterns. And to be able to actually show them up front whenever they're wanting to come into the platform itself and on board is a big, big struggle. The management of the databases as well also really challenges us from a troubleshooting aspect as well. And we'll, we'll look more at that whenever we're looking at why we'd actually be looking at RDS itself. The environment as well has a lot of excess capacity. Again, we try and fill it up as best as possible, but ultimately, living into the environment that we have at the minute, we don't have as much granular control as to what we can do. The day-to-day -day operations as well, being able to manage all these databases for backups, for maintenance, is a real, real struggle. And what we find is it's very, very slow for us to actually onboard new applications onto the environment. So we're present, we'll look, we will decide where is the best place for a database to go, but that takes time. And we also have the challenge of, with being on premise, we've end of server life. So every three years, we have to refresh the environment. And it takes time then to also obtain hardware where we really need to increase and grow our environment. And what we're trying to achieve is that next generation environment that really allows us to get through the challenges that we currently have. So why SQL in RDS? It would have been very, very easy for us just to go and use EC2, just to do what we do today. But what we really wanted to solve was the challenges that I outlined earlier. We want to be able to break those down and make things a lot more seamless and a lot easier to manage, and using a proven technology platform as well. By going to RDS, we'll really be able to solve an awful lot of problems and gain an awful lot of improvement. And one of the key things is really around our operational gain. If you think at the minute, whenever we need to spin up a new instance or a new server, whether that be on our physical or virtual environment, that takes an awful lot of time. RDS lets us really, really speed that up and be a lot more efficient moving forward. Patching as well. You know, every, roughly every, every month, 
We have an awful lot of patching in the environment, whether that be for operating system and SQL Server. So that takes the team an awful lot of time to go and prepare and to really work very, very closely with the application areas that we have to ensure that we can obviously get those patches put in in the time frame that we want. As I mentioned before, end of server life. Now we no longer need to worry about that every three year process and planning for that to occur. RDS will also then allow us to give explicit tiers of service. So at the minute, with the, with the consolidated environment, we're giving everybody exactly the same. But what we'll now be able to do is give a tier of service that meets the needs and requirements of the application areas and the business itself. We'll be able to slot by application. So we'll be very much able to right size what we actually want to put in place. And we'll be able to capacity manage a lot more effectively. Also by slotting per application will allow us to really show exactly what that charge is going to be. So from a showback model perspective, if you want to come into the environment, this is how much we anticipate it shall cost you. And we actually have some results later on that will show from the performance testing roughly what we saw the cost would actually be for us to move, depending upon the, the RDS class and the instance type itself. Also by slotting by the application, will allow us to give that predictable level of performance. At the minute, whenever we're adding a database in, there's the potential for this noisy neighbor syndrome. So today, whenever we do have that performance issue, it can be a challenge to really identify these things quickly. And we have had instances, for example, where we've had critical applications on the shared instances that have caused contention due to things such as bad execution plans, and that ultimately affects everybody on that instance itself. And what we see it is, is we can now, by leveraging RDS, is have that level of resource isolation and try and live into a model of what we see as a one app that may have multiple databases into a one container solution. We can also be very, very application centric. So giving the apps what they want and when they require it. So things like scaling of CPU, memory, storage, and provision IOPS. Today, if we wanted to do that, we just literally move from server A to server B, and there's no guarantee that that's actually going to fix the problems that we see. And we also then have the availability gains. You know, we are getting at least 99.95% availability built in versus the traditional data, data center model that we have. So next, I'm just going to go through some of the lessons that we actually learned as part of this. And the first part of that, I'm going to look at the performance piece. So we carried out a number of load tests on SQL Server and Amazon RDS with our partners, Fortify Data. And we carried out 50 repeatable tests using HammerDB and then set it on a synthetic workload. And as part of that, we use different parameters, and groups, and classes so we can understand what is the performance we can actually get out of this. We then also carried out some functional tests, roughly about 20 different test scenarios, and again, to see from a performance aspect, if we start to enable things, for example, database compression or transparent data encryption, how does that actually affect things? Now, by running the two tests, it allowed us to accomplish the following goals. It allowed us to look at the performance and scale that we'd be able to achieve, the cost, so to see you know, how much would this actually cost us moving forward into a cloud-based offering versus what we currently have. And as well as that, the feature impact, so whenever we would enable something like TDE or database compression, how does that actually affect what we have? So the lessons that we learned out of this were six key lessons. So we've learned about the capabilities. We have a clearer indication and understanding of what is actually capable using SQL RDS and what it would offer us today 
versus what we currently have. But as well as that, it's also shown us some of the potential drawbacks and limitations that we would actually need to factor in whenever we're working as part of the migration and moving databases from our on-premise solution into RDS itself. We learned very clearly about scaling, that we could only vertically scale. So we can scale from a CPU, memory, and storage aspect, but we can't horizontally scale. So we can't have read replicas as they're not supported within SQL RDS. And from a scaling aspect as well, it also helps them with the capacity planning. So we can give people what they want and start to then increase that capacity over time as they need it. From the availability perspective, again, we just reaffirmed that we should be able to achieve 99.95% availability, and we can use multi-AZ. Again, easier than the traditional model that we currently have. From a disaster recovery perspective, if we needed for any critical business applications that may want to go cross region, we learned that we'd be able to implement that via cross-region snapshot copies. So again, where there is a requirement, RDS allows us to live into that. When it came to the performance itself, we used CloudWatch to track the performance, and we used the DMVs to track those performance counters outside of those that could be captured in CloudWatch. And interestingly enough, what we saw was whenever we looked to use memory optimized, we were only actually achieving about 85% of the max IOPS that we actually wanted to get. Versus whenever we used the standard class, we were actually able to get the 100% IOPS. We also looked at the functional tests for things like TDE and database compression. And from that, we were able to see that it actually has no impact for us, or if anything, at a very, very minimal level. And what it helped us reaffirm was we would be able to move the current database applications that we have on premise and actually move them up to RDS without any issues. And finally, we have also learned about how we can then clearly define our catalog offerings. So what we can actually give to our clients and customers and clearly define that out from an aspect of the amount of compute and storage, as well as the RDS class and instance type itself. And that will also help us moving forward from a chargeback model perspective as well. So now on to the performance results. So what we did as part of the, the test, and as I said before, is we looked through the, the, the different RDS classes. So we looked at standard and memory optimized, and we used different instance types. And as part of that, we were able to gain and glean good information as to what we would be able to achieve from a max IOPS perspective, Jesus. and what the maximum megabytes per second throughput would be. But it also showed us that to actually achieve max, maximum IOPS available, we would need to have a minimum amount of storage provisioned as part of that. So again, we've learned that, yes, if we need this, this is what we need to factor in and do going forward. And finally, we were then also able to pull out our cost results. So actually looking at whenever we have a standard class of uh, M4X large for an on-demand instance, how much that would cost versus reserved. And it also has then helped us really build a case together to understand when and where we will use specific types of environments. So is it suitable for test? Is it maybe just going to be used for a small to mid-production size? Or is it going to have that heavy, heavy workload there? Now, see the results that we we have shown here is looking at the, the single instance cost, but we can just double that cost up to actually look at the, the multi-AZ model itself. So that concludes session today.
I'd like to thank everybody very much for coming along and listening. If anybody has any questions, uh, we have Prashant and Richard, uh, who shall come on stage to answer them. And we've got thank the you. microphone over here, so if you'd please step up to the microphone so the camera can capture your question, that'd be fantastic. Thanks, Claude. Okay, awesome. Thanks. No questions? <laughs> yeah, um, any questions? You know, we'll, we'll also hang around here for a bit after the, after the hour is up, so if you have any questions, come up to us. Oh, there we go. I have one question. Hey, uh, for audience, uh, that is, uh, is bulk admin server role supported? Because uh, we, we are in the initial phases of migration. So uh, when we are testing that uh, bulk admin, one of the application uh, process, it failed, saying that uh, it doesn't have bulk admin privileges. When we try to grant it, we were not allowed to. So can you just touch what server roles are provided available in RDS? Right, OK. So the server roles that we grant are uh, setup admin, process admin, and public. Um, so, you know, bulk insert is something that is not supported today. Bulk copy is supported. Okay. So, if you can use that, you know, to migrate any tables, that might work. Um, or, you know, as I was saying, just a native backup restore is probably like the best way of doing the migration. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Thank you. And if you search for it, all of the permissions that we grant to the RDS super user account that, that you have access to are documented for each database engine. So, it is up in the documentation page. Okay. So uh, just for future reference, it, it is out there. Sure, sure. But it's not, it's not with the SQL Server documentation, unfortunately. So just. Oh, OK. Look, so one look. practical question. You said uh, you implemented cross-region uh, replication for your DR, right? So in Allstate, what challenges you faced implementing uh, cross-region disaster recovery? So that's just something we're just actually starting to look at now. So what we did as part of that testing was to test and understand how we'd actually be able to do that using cross-region snapshots. But we further work just to take place just to affirm how that will actually look. Now, the multi-AZ model will pretty much cover everything that we require. So this would be very much an edge case just where we may need to have that cross-region region, uh, set up. All right, thank you. For the multi-AZ, can we have it across regions? No, so multi-AZ is you know, essentially it's synchronous replication, and that is in a region. Um, if you want ongoing replication cross-region, then you can use database migration service. So for database migration service, it doesn't matter whether your target is in the same region or a different region. You can set that up. That is asynchronous, so it won't even have much of a performance impact on your primary. Or you what could, I know we're in an RDS session, but the other option there is you could set up your own always on availability group on EC2 uh -huh. until we have that option in RDS. That would be another backup plan. Okay. And then finally, there's also a partner solution, Cloud Basic. We'll use uh, simple change tracking right. to make a copy of your instance as well from RDS. So three separate options to address that. Thank you. Hi. Um, I have a question regarding um, your licensing. So when you, you mentioned that uh, you have a highly consolidated environment in on-prem, when you move to AWS RDS environment, how did you deal with the licensing, SQL Server licensing? So for the licensing aspect of that, we're just working through actually working that out. So we, ha we haven't actually fully moved anything up into RDS at present. Now, when it comes to that, as you say, you know, with, with the highly consolidated environment, you know, we, we cover off an awful lot. But what we've also looked at is as part of that license and, and part of our cost is, you know, how much is that going to cost today versus moving forward into the future? Okay, thank you. Hey, uh, I again have a question on multi-region, but uh, I looked into the options, I Cloud Basic DMS and the snapshot uh, copy over the region. Uh, I wanted to know is, DMS, using DMS for cross-region replication, because you mentioned migrating between SQL to SQL using DMS is not a good, good option. But if I use that for cross-region replication, is that a good option? No, so actually what I meant was it's not the best option. Okay. Right? So if you, 
if you're doing a migration, then the native backup restore is the best. But for logical replication, you know, then definitely DMS is, a, is an elegant solution. It works, and you can use that for cross-region. Okay. Right, and, and the, the big motivator for that is we'll support transactional replication, for example, for SQL Server if you wanted to use a replication solution as receiving those transactions from a push subscription, but we don't support running the transactional replication subsystem inside of RDS itself. So the next best option for that is to use DMS with CDC because we don't support the replication subsystem. Okay. Uh, another question I have is now we're using uh, AG as uh, for multi-AZ, right? So is there something which is coming up which wherein we can use the secondary replica as read replica? So um, you know, we are looking at read replicas. We haven't decided on how we want to do it. Um, but you know, that's something that we are considering. Okay. Thank you. And, and basically, the, the best step for you is to get a hold of your account team, your account SA, and let them know that you need that feature. They'll communicate that to us through a product feature request, and then we can get you on the list for a potential early trial, for example, when we do start working on that feature. So do make sure you contact your account team and put in that specific request, because the more people that do that, the more likely it is to come sooner. Sure. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, uh, I had a quick question on, so when you guys were on-prem, did you have any ETL packages that ran to load the data into the database? And once you migrated to the RDS, what's the current process, uh, any particular ETL tool that you guys are using? Sorry, could you repeat that? I, did, I just didn't get the first part. Sure, of that. so when you were on-prem, did you have any SSIs packages or an ETL tool that you used to load, transform, and like load, extract, transform, and load the data. Yeah, yeah. So at present, yes. So our some of our application areas, you know, they will have SSIS on their application servers to actually do that load. So we don't actually host that for them. So we pretty much push that off to them to, if they require SSIS and do the, that ETL work, they handle it themselves. And so one thing I'll say is, you know, if you're having an SSIS package and you want to use that with RDS, yep. if your package is reading from RDS or it's writing to RDS, that still works. You have to host it on an EC2 instance, you know, and then you can use that as your like, central SSIS repository. Again, you know, this is like good feedback for us, you know, um, as uh, Richard was saying, just talk to your account drive, right? make sure you know, that the feedback comes to us, and we'll, we'll try and see if there's something we can do with ISAS and RS in RDS. Sure, this is what we currently do. I was just wondering if RD has a, RDS has a new cap uh, capability where we can somehow use SSIS package to run on the RDS server directly instead of hosting an EC2 and then letting the EC2 instance talk to the RDS one. Right, so what you're doing right now is, is, is the only option, yeah. but again, this is That's good feedback hack. for us, yeah. right? Yeah. All right, cool, thank cool. you. Um, you know, I think we're losing the room, so we'll stop the presentation, and you know, but we'll be hanging around here, so if you want, you can just come and ask us. Thank you so much. Thank you.